Hi, I'm Dr. Ted Delbridge, Executive Director of MEMS. I know your time is valuable and the time you spend watching this will be time that you never get back. But I wanted to take this opportunity to mention just a few things and mostly it comes down to thank you. I've been at my job a little over a year now and it's a pretty cool assignment. What's the best part you might ask? Working with and for you. I haven't met most of you, but I've met many of you. And the time you spend with me, whether at the station, at the hospital, at meetings or conferences, or on the street, have been important. The perspectives you provide and the knowledge I gain are invaluable. And thank you especially to those of you who have or will allow me the privilege of spending the entire day with you to get your insight. Maryland EMS is all about its people. Maryland EMS has a storied history of vision and innovation. And that's all great. But in 2020, it's about the 18,000 EMS clinicians who are dedicated to being experts in their field. Your commitment, not just to the mission, but to being your very best is what stands out. Nothing could be more true than your response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to the one million calls for help you'll answer this year, each with its own unique set of circumstances. When other people are at their worst, you bring out your very best. Thank you. What isn't as obvious to the public is the amount of teamwork it takes to deliver efficient and expert care to someone who really needs it. We typically don't work alone. We work in teams that are dynamic collaborations of people with varying skills and expertise. And as is often the case, in terms of mutual aid that happens effortlessly, we work with folks from other teams to bring the needed resources to bear. All this is made possible by a common language and a common understanding. And in the case of clinical care, that common language are our clinical protocols. We continue to work to make sure protocols are succinct, relevant, and useful tools. Mostly, they must be scientifically sound and help facilitate the care that EMS clinicians are trying to provide. Thank you in advance for your valuable time that you will spend to learn of important protocol updates in just a few moments. Finally, I feel strongly about the concept of EMS clinician. Clinician is a term of distinction. It indicates professionalism, caring, expertise, and commitment. In closing, thank you for your dedication, your camaraderie, and for embodying the spirit of EMS clinician. Godspeed. Hello, everyone. I want to take this opportunity to thank you, all of Maryland's EMS clinicians, for your tireless dedication during the COVID-19 pandemic. These have been uncertain times, and you've continued to answer the call for our patients in their time of greatest need. You've adapted to work restrictions, PPE challenges, and emerging guidance, sometimes on a daily basis related to the novel coronavirus. Due to COVID-19, we have delayed the implementation date for this year's protocol until August the 1st to give you a little more time to complete the update. I'm sincerely appreciative for you taking some of your time to get up to speed on the latest Maryland EMS protocol updates for this year. Our goals continue to be streamlined protocols which limit the need for consultation unless it would likely be valuable for the treatment of your patient. To that end, I want to mention a few brief changes before you begin the update. First, we've eliminated the consultation for diphenhydramine, or Benadryl, as it is no longer necessary. This medication can be safely and appropriately administered by ALS clinicians without the need for consult. Second, we will streamline the cardioversion energy sequence to the following. First, for SVT, atrial flutter, or ventricular tachycardia, an initial shock will be given at 100 joules, followed by subsequent shocks at 200 joules, then 300 joules, then 360 joules, if necessary. For atrial fibrillation, an initial shock will be, will be given at 200 joules, followed by subsequent shocks at 300 joules, then 360 joules. Of note, if the manufacturer recommendations on your monitor differ from this sequence, you may follow the recommended energy settings on your monitor. The dosing for cardioversion for pediatric patients is unchanged. Finally, we have instituted a simple yet evidence-based intervention for patients with nausea and vomiting that all EMS clinicians may use. The protocol now states that you may allow a patient to inhale vapor from an isopropyl alcohol wipe three times every 15 minutes as needed for nausea or vomiting. We hope that you will find this 2020 protocol update both succinct and informative. As we move through 2020, we will continue in our efforts to completely reformat the protocol and make it more user-friendly. On behalf of all of us at MIMS, we pass along our wishes to you for good health and thank you for your continued dedication. Effective August 1st, 2020, 
the Chest Pain Acute Coronary Syndrome Protocol will be renamed to simply the Acute Coronary Syndrome Protocol and include several changes. The major change for all clinicians will be the emphasis on the administration of aspirin as soon as possible. Previously, aspirin was listed fifth in the treatment section, but starting August 1st, it moves up to second on that list. By way of a brief review, acute coronary syndrome, or ACS, includes signs and symptoms of decreased blood flow to the heart muscle. These may include chest pain, pressure, tightness, pain or discomfort in one or both arms, jaw, neck, back, or stomach, shortness of breath, feeling dizzy or lightheaded, nausea, and sweating, even without other apparent cause. The adult dose of aspirin will remain the same, 324 or 325 milligrams, chewed depending on the packaging, but the need for the patients to have a suspected acute myocardial infarction will no longer be necessary for clinicians to administer the aspirin. The protocol will now state if the patient has received the full dose of 324 or 325 milligrams prior to EMS arrival, the patient should not receive additional doses from EMS clinicians. However, if the patient received less than the full dose prior to EMS arrival and the clinicians can determine how much more aspirin the patient would need to meet the full dose, only that remaining amount of aspirin should be administered to reach the full dose. With regard to pediatric patients, the administration of aspirin will remain contraindicated. Now, let's see if you understand this change. You have responded to a report of a sick person at a local assisted living facility. Upon arrival, you are presented with a 76-year-old patient who complains of substernal chest pain, scoring 8 out of 10 on the pain scale, which started at rest while checking her email. While you await arrival of the ALS unit, the patient states that she has been prescribed nitroglycerin in the past and hands you the bottle. Your partner states the vital signs are blood pressure 156 over 82, pulse of 78, and a respiratory rate of 16. What is your next priority? Would you A. Ask the patient for her bottle of nitroglycerin, check the five rights of medication administration, and administer 0.4 milligrams of nitroglycerin under the patient's tongue? Or would you B. Ask your partner to hand you four of the 81 milligram prepackaged tablets of aspirin for a total of 324 milligrams and then explain to the patient the need for her to chew the pills before administering the nitroglycerin tablet. The correct answer according to the 2020 protocols, is B, that you ask your partner to hand you four of the 81 milligram prepackaged tablets of aspirin for a total of 324 milligrams, and then explain to the patient the need for her to chew the pills before administering the nitroglycerin tablet. With the 2020 changes, administering aspirin to patients with suspected acute coronary syndrome or having a STEMI takes priority over assisting the patient with taking their prescribed nitroglycerin. Effective August 1, 2020, Maryland EMS clinicians will have more direction for when they interact with the event or team physicians at the scene of a heat-related emergency. While there are no changes to EMS patient care for heat-related emergencies with this protocol revision, the result of the new alert may cause a difference in the scene management. Many times at team practices, games, and athletic events, such as marathons and races, on-site physicians and athletic trainers are available and already providing care prior to the arrival of EMS clinicians. In these cases, active cooling may be readily available at the scene. Such measures are available to EMS and may require significant setup time at the ED. 
potentially introducing further delays in the cooling for the patient. One technique for treating heat emergencies is to use active cooling measures such as an on-site ice bath to quickly lower the patient's core body temperature. The cooling measure may be in progress upon your arrival. Working with the on-site team or event physician, you should allow active cooling to continue until the patient's body temperature is below 102 degrees Fahrenheit or the patient's mental status has improved. Once the patient's condition has improved, work with the staff to prepare the patient for transport to the closest appropriate emergency department. Should there be a disagreement between you and the on-site team or event physician about the course of treatment, contact a base station for online medical consultation. Now, let's see how well you understand this change. You have responded to a report of a heat exposure at the local high school. Upon arrival, you are met by a physician who identifies themselves as being part of the athletic department staff who tells you she is caring for an athlete who had syncopal episode, is now conscious, but has an altered mental status. As you continue to the athletic field, the team physician goes on to tell you that they just started treating the patient in an ice bath. What should your next course of action be? Would you, A, tell the physician you and your partner will work to get the stretcher into position to transfer the patient once their temperature has decreased to below 102 degrees Fahrenheit or their mental status has improved? Once that occurs, you can load the patient for transfer to the appropriate facility. Or would you, B, Tell the physician you and your partner will work to get the stretcher into position to transfer the patient immediately because the patient is a high priority and must be transported to the closest emergency department as soon as possible for continued care. The correct answer is A. To tell the physician you and your partner will work to get the stretcher into position to transfer the patient once the temperature has decreased to below 102 degrees Fahrenheit or their mental status has improved. Once that occurs, you can load the patient for transport to the appropriate facility. Working as a team with the on-site team or event physician to lower the patient's body temperature and or to improve the mental status prior to transport may lead to an improved outcome for the patient. Effective August 1st, 2020, there has been an addition to the general patient care protocol as it relates to the treatment of bleeding. This change allows you, the EMS clinician, the ability to determine the best method based on the patient's injuries to manage profuse bleeding using a variety of methods. These choices include direct pressure, wound packing, using hemostatic gauze, or the application of a tourniquet or junctional tourniquet with jurisdictional training. Regardless of the method employed by the responder, the key to each is that they apply pressure to the profusely bleeding wound. Let's take a moment and examine each method available. Direct pressure is something that we have all been taught from our earliest days in EMS. Initial direct pressure may be simply a gloved hand at first, but other dressings can then be held firm to the wound with manual pressure or roller gauze. Wound packing can be accomplished using either hemostatic or plain gauze or other dressing. Wound packing is a great option in large, deep wounds or those which continue to bleed following two-hand direct pressure. The key here is to use wound packing in situations in which a tourniquet is either unavailable or just simply cannot be used because of wound location. And finally, there is the tourniquet or junctional tourniquet option. Tourniquets are the ideal life-saving tool for profuse or life-threatening wounds in the extremities. The key to using a tourniquet is that you should apply them 
two to three inches above the wound, and you should never apply a tourniquet over a joint. If need be, go above the joint from the wound and apply the tourniquet there. If the source of the bleeding on an extremity is unclear, such as you cannot see the bleeding wound, place the tourniquet as proximal on the affected limb as possible. Now, let's explore if you understand this change. You arrive at the scene where there has been a fight and one of the patients has been stabbed in his armpit. After making sure the scene is secure and safe, you find a large, deep wound with a significant volume of blood loss and continued bleeding. You begin treatment by applying gauze and direct pressure to the wound. The bleeding continues. What should your next treatment for this life-threatening wound be in accordance with the 2020 general care protocols? Should you apply a tourniquet as high on the arm as possible to attempt to stop the bleeding? Or should you pack the wound with a hemostatic dressing and maintain manual pressure to stop the bleeding? The correct answer in this circumstance is to pack the wound with a hemostatic dressing and maintain manual pressure to stop the bleeding. If the wound was further down the extremity, the tourniquet could have been employed. However, the tourniquet will not control bleeding in the patient's armpit. Pediatric Termination of Resuscitation, or TOR, has been substantially changed in the 2020 Maryland Medical EMS Protocols. While TOR has become a standard practice for adult patients since it was first introduced in Maryland seven years ago, patients under age 18 have been generally excluded from TOR outside of unusual circumstances. We know that pediatric cardiac arrests are high-stress calls, and not wanting to add to that stress for EMS clinicians, we have adopted very stringent criteria for futility of resuscitation in children. The criteria is intentionally quite different from the TOR protocol for adults. This difference is because the science of cardiac arrest for pediatrics differs from adults in important ways. Let me start by outlining the common ground. The same criteria for presumed dead on arrival still apply to patients of all ages. Based upon a systematic review over three years of all pediatric cardiac arrests in the state, we have found that many infant cardiac arrest calls in Maryland describe the baby as being in rigor mortis or having dependent lividity. Children with obvious signs of death can be declared in the field and do not need to have CPR initiated. If civilians or first responders or initial EMS initiated CPR, it does not need to be continued once EMS notes obvious signs of death. Secondly, both adult and pediatric patients with traumatic cardiac arrest outside the hospital have very low chance of survival unless EMS is able to return spontaneous circulation at the scene. For both children and adults, after initiation of CPR, the first order of business should be attempting to correct reversible causes. For example, needle decompression for attention pneumothorax. If ROSC is not obtained within 10 minutes after traumatic cardiac arrest, the chance of survival is essentially zero. However, for children with non-traumatic cardiac arrest, etiologies are very different than seen in adult patients with cardiac arrest. While adults have primarily cardiac causes, for children, hypoxia or respiratory arrest is much more likely to have led to the cardiac arrest. We also know that treatment of children differs from adults in two main ways. First, it is essential that children get good quality rescue breathing. And secondly, children will benefit more than adults from the early administration of epinephrine. While AED use is important, only a small percentage of children in cardiac arrest have a shockable rhythm. Because we all want to save every single child who has a chance at a good outcome, and because we equally want every Maryland EMS clinician to feel secure in his or her decisions and not add stress to the job, we have established specific and sequential criteria 
within the process of termination of resuscitation for pediatrics. If any of these criteria are not met, or if the EMS clinician is not confident in their judgment, it is always appropriate to continue CPR and transport to the closest appropriate hospital. The first set of criteria establish a definition of futility, where we do not reasonably expect any chance at a good outcome for the patient. For non-traumatic cardiac arrest, as for adult patients, EMS has completed a minimum of 30 minutes of high-performance CPR as defined by 15 two-minute cycles without return of spontaneous circulation. In addition, for consideration of termination of resuscitation in children under 18, ALS must be on scene. There are three specific criteria that must be met. At least one dose of epinephrine has been administered. At the end of the 30 minutes or more of high-performance CPR, there is a systole on the monitor. At the end of 30 minutes or more of high-performance CPR, the end tidal carbon dioxide reading is consistently less than 15. For traumatic cardiac arrest, for children as for adults, EMS must have completed a minimum of 10 minutes of high-performance CPR as defined by five two-minute cycles without return of spontaneous circulation and must have attempted to correct all reversible causes of traumatic arrest. In addition, for consideration of termination of resuscitation in children under 15, there must be a systole on the monitor and an end tidal carbon dioxide reading of less than 15 if ALS is available. If ALS is not available in the case of traumatic cardiac arrest, VLS may initiate termination of resuscitation. There are two additional criteria that assess scene safety and psychological harm to the family, bystanders, EMS crews, and other public safety professionals. It is critically important that EMS clinicians use their best judgment to determine when it is wise to use pediatric field termination of resuscitation and when not to. If the seen EMS clinicians determine that these factors are not met, they should continue CPR and transport to the closest ED. First, in the judgment of EMS and law enforcement on scene, there is adequate social and emotional support and safety for civilians and all professionals on scene. Second, in the judgment of EMS and law enforcement, the scene is amenable to leaving the patient on scene. The time frame for the medical examiner forensic investigator to arrive is a consideration in some geographic areas. These caveats mean that there is wide latitude for EMS clinicians to decide to transport, even when there is little to no hope of survival. If your judgment is that initiating pediatric tour and leaving the deceased child on scene is not a good idea, continue CPR and transport to the closest ED. The death of a child is one of the hardest days you face in EMS, and we know the weight of these calls is heavy. We are working to develop support tools to enhance the efforts of your critical incident stress management teams and education modules to further explain the science behind this protocol. In addition, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you want pediatric expert advice, the Pediatric Specialty Base Stations at Johns Hopkins Children's Center and Children's National are always available for online consultation in real time. Let's consider a scenario. It is 8 a.m. You are dispatched to a home where a six-month-old infant has been found in bed, unresponsive and not breathing. 
a law enforcement first responder is on scene and has started CPR. You assess the infant and confirm that the patient is not breathing, has no pulse, and notice that the baby is stiff and cold. The mother and grandmother are sitting in the living room, hugging each other and sobbing quietly. Another family member is on the phone with their pastor. What should you do next? A. Determine if law enforcement is prepared to assume control of the scene. B. Take over CPR from the first responder and provide at least 30 minutes of high-performance CPR on-site before considering termination of resuscitation. C. Remove the baby and yourself from the home. Do high-performance CPR in the back of the ambulance. D. Stop CPR now and declare the patient dead. There are actually multiple correct options available to you in this scenario. The scene as described is physically safe, so the only wrong answer here is moving the baby to the back of the ambulance. You should resuscitate in place. Moving the patient means precious seconds lost in the chain of high-performance CPR. If you see obvious signs of death, you may stop CPR and declare the patient dead. However, before you do so, it's always a good idea to coordinate with other public safety officials to verify that they are ready to assume control of the scene. Depending on your location and the local resources, this can be a significant issue. If you are ever unsure about the more subtle signs, like Riger, take over CPR and continue high-performance CPR for at least 30 minutes after which termination of resuscitation can be considered. Hello, my name is Ryan Felling. I'm the director of the Pediatric Stroke Program at Johns Hopkins. Today I'm going to talk to you about pediatric stroke to raise awareness that time is brain at any age. I'm presenting this lecture in honor of one of our patients, Lainey James Fitzsimmons. So to begin, what is a stroke? The World Health Organization defined stroke in 1980 as the rapid onset of clinical signs of brain dysfunction lasting more than 24 hours. There are a number of terms that are associated with stroke, such as cerebral infarction, ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, and others. In children, we also take other things into consideration, such as patient age. For a stroke that occurs between 28 weeks gestation to 28 days of life, we term this perinatal stroke. Everything else in older children is termed childhood stroke. There are also different types of stroke that can occur in children. These include arterial ischemic stroke, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and hemorrhagic stroke, which includes intracerebral hemorrhage not due to trauma and uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Perinatal stroke occurs in 40 out of 100,000 term births. We claim that it's the highest risk period of life for stroke, but the reason that we don't see as many babies as we do older adults with stroke is that that risk is compressed down to only one or two days around the time of birth. The majority of these are ischemic stroke or caused by lack of blood flow to the brain. Childhood stroke, by comparison, becomes much more rare, occurring in only two to three per 100,000 patients although there are many thoughts that this may be underestimated. While this seems very rare, it's similar to the incidence of pediatric brain cancer, of which people are well aware. So it's important to recognize that strokes can happen at any age. In adults, we often think of the typical cardiovascular risk factors for stroke. Cholesterol, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and high blood pressure. These are not typical risk factors in children. In children, heart disease, both congenital and acquired, is an important contributor to stroke. The most common risk factor is a class of disorders called vasculopathies. These are abnormalities in the blood vessels themselves. Stroke presents in children similar to the way it presents in adults. These can include a variety of symptoms depending on which part of the brain is affected. Sensory motor deficits 
including hemiplegia or weakness on one side of the body, unilateral sensory deficits or neglect of one side of the world, visual field cuts, gaze preferences with both eyes deviated to one side, and cranial nerve defects. Additionally, speech changes, including aphasia, either word finding difficulty or nonsense speech, and dysarthria, or slurred speech, can occur. And children can also present with nonspecific symptoms, such as vertigo and nausea or vomiting, seizures, which are typically focal seizures, behavior changes, and abnormal levels of consciousness. I also want to raise a specific point regarding seizures in pediatric stroke. In adults, it is very uncommon for a stroke to present with a seizure. In children, this is certainly not the case. In fact, seizure is the presenting symptom in about 20% of pediatric stroke cases. This is even more common in perinatal stroke, when it's frequently the only localizing sign in neonates. Seizures that occur because of a stroke are typically focal, and the seizure corresponds to a subsequent deficit or an area of weakness. It is important to recognize the possibility that seizures present as stroke to avoid the mistake of missing a stroke in favor of a seizure. As an EMS clinician, what can you do when you've identified a patient that you suspect may be having a stroke. We can think about the four T's. First is time. It's important to recognize a stroke rapidly. This way you can triage the patient. This can help to determine the time of onset and to get information from people who may be at the scene and had discovered the patient's symptoms. In the field, treatment measures can be instituted to help maintain cerebral perfusion, and most importantly, transporting the patient to the nearest experienced pediatric stroke center to receive proper treatment. Time. We recite the mantra that time is brain at any age. Why is time brain? One study looked at the loss of neurons during the course of a typical stroke. They estimated that every minute of ischemia leads to the loss of 1.9 million neurons in the brain. This is in adults, but it's also true in children, so it's important to realize that time is brain at any age. Triage. One of the most important pieces of information that clinicians need to know is the time of onset, or if a stroke was unwitnessed, the time that the patient was last known to be normal. If Witnesses at the scene are able to provide this information. It will help speed up the process of diagnosing and treating the patient at the hospital. Also, the tempo of onset. Strokes begin suddenly. Sometimes they can occur in a stuttering fashion, starting and stopping abruptly. It is very rare for a stroke to occur gradually over time in a more subacute fashion. What treatment options are available prior to arriving at the hospital. Of course, we always focus on ABCs, maintaining the airway, ensuring that the patient is breathing, and maintaining circulation. In a patient with suspected stroke, we want to maintain normoxemia, providing supplemental oxygen if the oxygen saturation is low. For perfusion, we want to try to provide blood flow to the brain. This can be done with augmenting with IV fluids, including normal saline, and with positioning, putting the head of the bed no higher than 30 degrees. We also want to maintain normal glucose levels and emphasize treating hypoglycemia, as this can be very dangerous in exacerbating a stroke. Similarly, we want to reduce the metabolic demand of the brain and rapidly treat any fever or seizure appropriately. And the fourth T is transport. Children with suspected strokes are best treated in experienced pediatric stroke centers. Adult stroke centers might not have the appropriate sized equipment or expertise. 
In Maryland, we have two pediatric stroke centers in the region, in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins Children's Center, and in Washington, D.C., Children's National Medical Center. So in summary, stroke can occur in children and is one of the most time-sensitive neurologic diagnoses to make. There are key neuroprotective treatments that can be initiated based on clinical suspicion. Pediatric stroke centers can provide similar therapies as their adult counterparts, and the rapid recognition of stroke in children can significantly improve outcome. We had a previously healthy three-year-old girl who presented with recurrent episodes of facial droop with hemiparesis and slurred speech or dysarthria. These episodes would last up to 10 minutes. So there are several things that we need to consider in presentations such as these. Given the topic of this talk, stroke or TIA, of course, has to be a consideration. These present as sudden onset focal abnormalities of varying duration. Seizures are often considered in a patient such as this. Seizures usually manifest with tonic or clonic movements, but weakness can present after a seizure as a post-ictal syndrome. Another consideration is migraines. Migraine headaches can present with focal abnormalities similar to stroke or TIA, but they typically immediately precede a moderate to severe headache. Our patient was transported to a local emergency room, and by the time she arrived, her symptoms had resolved. The patient was diagnosed with suspected complex partial seizures, but no imaging was done at that time. She was started on anti-seizure medicine and sent home, where she developed a severe skin reaction to the medicine. Several days later, she presented with similar symptoms of weakness and slurred speech that did not resolve. Again, she was admitted to the hospital and diagnosed and managed as a patient with seizures. Several days later, they were able to obtain imaging. The MRI that they obtained showed acute ischemia, as you can see in the image on the left, with the bright signal in the right hemisphere of the brain. This young girl had a progressive arteriopathy called Moya Moya disease, and she suffered from recurrent strokes and TIAs. The image on the right shows the abnormalities in her blood vessels. Normally, the blood vessels would extend throughout the brain, but you can see here where the blood vessels narrow down and nearly occlude. There are some very important lessons to learn from this patient. Stroke in children is often misdiagnosed in favor of more common mimics, such as seizures and migraines. Importantly, the early recognition of stroke in children provides the opportunity to limit brain damage and prevent the recurrence of further strokes 